Hello, I'm Adrian Finnegan. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your look at the world of business and economics. This week, Brazil's president's handling of the coronavirus crisis could see the economy slump to its worst performance since 1900. No longer recession-proof, more than one million healthcare jobs have been lost in the United States during the pandemic. And recession, courts against bailouts and maybe finally a fiscal union. Will Angela Merkel's 500 billion euro plan save the European Union? The coronavirus pandemic hasn't spared a single nation or economy, but the way some governments have handled the crisis has raised eyebrows. Brazil's right-wing populist leader, Jair Bolsonaro, has been dismissive about the health crisis and implored people to ignore state governors who'd ordered lockdowns and social distancing measures. The result? Brazil has the third highest number of confirmed coronavirus cases behind the US and Russia. A study by Imperial College suggests that 70,000 to 1 million Brazilians could die depending on measures taken to halt the progress of the pandemic. Its healthcare system has been decimated since 2017. Brazil's expenditure on its national health service has been slashed by $4.4 billion, or slightly less than a third of its current budget. And it's close to collapse under the sheer number of COVID-19 patients. Now, despite a stimulus package, the economy is expected to contract 4.7% this year. That's the biggest fall since 1900. The situation is so bad that President Trump is considering banning Brazilians from travelling to the United States. Bolsonaro has been criticised at home and abroad. So how much damage will this do to the economy and its 209 million people? Let's ask Jimena Blanco. She's the head of America's Risk Insights at Verisk Maplecroft. And Jimena joins us now via Skype from Buenos Aires. Good to have you with us. Uh, so he's lost two health ministers. His ratings have dropped 9%. He belittled the pandemic and said... So what, when questioned on the lot of, uh, loss of life, um, what are we to make of, of Bolsonaro's handling of the crisis? Well, Adrian, I don't think it will be surprising to say it's been dismal, uh, not only from a healthcare perspective, but from a political perspective as well. It's really laid bare the uh, differences and the, the infighting that can happen in a federal system when you have the president sitting on one side governors are in, on another and people caught in between. So the main risk for the Brazilian economy right now, it's not only stemming from the high number, you know, the high infection rate, uh, the mortality that's in, increasing quite quickly, but also from the fact that governors may now decide to go into lockdown measures rather than uh, very flexible quarantines in an attempt to uh, contain the pandemic. And now those measures will come in uh, a bit too late, meaning that they would need to stay in place much, much longer in order to deliver the, the type of response that has been delivered in other countries in the region. So what's the, the economic prognosis for Brazil's economy? Like so many uh, populists, uh, so much was, was promised. Has Bolsonaro delivered? Yes, well, I mean, the tide is turning as well there with the public because, uh, you know, over 50% of Brazilians think the, the economy is heading in the wrong direction. And so this year, it will certainly have a contraction. The question is, how deep will that contraction be? Um, and, you know, estimates range anywhere between five and a half to eight points. That would put it as the biggest contraction uh, in the country in recent history and surpassing the contractions we experienced in Brazil's recent uh, recession. Now, the economy hadn't completely recovered from that recession, so unemployment remained high, and the risk of a significant increase in poverty levels also remains high. And what about um, uh, Bolsonaro's possible impeachment and uh, uh, these accusations of interference in, uh, in police work? What, what is that doing to investor sentiment? Well, that clearly is the strongest threat to his continuation in power because it implies criminal charges. And so any impeachment would go through the Supreme Court. But let's not forget that there are 30 other impeachment requests that have been filed before Congress. So, you know, even if we were to remove the criminal charges, there's increasing risk of the political tide turning against the president and his former allies in Congress uh, deciding to cut him loose, you know, much earlier than you would have expected otherwise. He's 
currently a president without a political party because he resigned his party and hasn't been able to form one. So his ability to keep alliances in Congress will be crucial. And at the moment, he seems to be burning bridges with pretty much anyone. Uh, just quickly, before we end, uh, uh, Jimena, while we've got you here, um, uh, Argentina's debt negotiations, uh, are creditors ready to do a deal, do you think? Well, yes, I think creditors are willing to enter a deal with Argentina. It's just it won't happen by the deadline of today. Uh, so the, formally, the country will enter default. Um, and now, you know, there could be a quick resolution. Let's not forget that the amount that's been defaulted on is just above $500 million, considering that there's $65 billion to be renegotiated. It's a very small sum. Um, but the country could also be entering a very fragmented negotiation with a variety of groups at different timelines. So it's going to be a story that might be ongoing for the rest of 2020. Jimena, really good to talk to you on Counting the Cost. Many thanks indeed for being with us. No problem. Thank you. Millions of jobs are being lost due to the coronavirus pandemic. Despite the saying that the virus doesn't discriminate, it is having an unequal and devastating impact on low-income workers, immigrants and women. But an altogether rather startling situation despite the pandemic is that medical personnel are losing their jobs. Al Jazeera's Shahab Ratanzi reports. It hasn't gone unnoticed that even as the US salutes frontline workers, in this case with military flyovers at a conservatively estimated $60,000 an hour over at least 22 cities, healthcare workers are being fired at alarming rates due to a lack of funds. And that's despite $100 billion in funding passed by Congress specifically to help medical providers. Preliminary estimates for April show a loss of 1.4 million healthcare jobs, with 135,000 hospital staff sacked as revenue-rich elective surgeries and routine visits were cancelled. These data report um, on the situation as of the 12th of the month. So what we're seeing today is what was going on in and around the middle of April. So I certainly think I, I would not be surprised to see more losses when we see next month's data. 317 staff were fired at this hospital in San Diego. Those who remain say some of those were frontline COVID staff. As with millions of others in the US, they're now without their employer-based health insurance when they may need it most. Everybody was stunned, right? We're still devastated. Uh, we're reeling from that decision. Um, everybody demoralized on the floor is not right now. And of course our work is being affected because a lot of the people that were laid off were nurses. And now they're worried that, okay, so after the 14 uh, day, uh, between two to 14 day incubation period, what if we get infected and now we don't have insurance? So it's easy for a lot of hospital um, executives to say, oh, you know, these healthcare workers and nurses are heroes. And then they can easily just drop us off like nothing. But Palomar Health, which runs the hospital, said it had no choice. Not only is revenue down in areas not connected to the pandemic, it isn't treating high numbers of COVID patients either. Meanwhile, healthcare workers who remain are seeing their hours and wages cut while fearing job loss. And that's particularly so in what had been a little noticed but growing sector in US medicine. Hospitals and medical staffing controlled by private equity firms. Wall Street spent $100 billion on healthcare assets in 2018 alone. Private equity's financial bottle is based on profits for investors that beat the rest of the market, and that's made these assets particularly vulnerable now. Private equity has moved heavily into laboratory testing, emergency rooms, anesthesiology, radiology, as well as specialist areas like orthopedics, cornering regional markets to control pricing. These are services that hospitals then contract out, often unbeknownst to patients. Those emergency rooms are the ones that have been at the forefront of cutting salaries, of cutting doctor salaries. It's the extreme form of a for-profit system. They are re reacting quickly in order to get their money out to repay their investors before the organizations collapse. Wall Street has also bought up hospitals across the country with heavily leveraged buyouts. For example, this is Eastern Hospital, bought in 2015 by the private equity firm Cerberus's healthcare unit, Steward. Cerberus is worth $43 billion. They 
immediately, immediately sold off all the property underneath it. Now that means that Easton is immediately paying outsized rent on property it owned since 1890. And Steward um, System has done that in all of the hospitals it's bought. It buys hospitals across the country, loads them with debt, and immediately sells out the property underneath them and pays themselves back dividends. But Easton's financial precariousness as a result of the buyout presented Stewart with an opportunity. With the pandemic yet to hit, Stewart threatened to shut down the hospital, the region's defence against COVID-19, with a loss of 694 staff if it didn't receive a government bailout of $40 million. So far, the governor has given the hospital and its private equity owners $8 million from federal COVID-19 stimulus funds. But the threat remains if Wall Street doesn't get the rest. Private equity says it's not to blame. It has high costs because of medical insurance companies, it claims. And it's true, insurance companies are already seeing and projecting healthy profits as a result of the pandemic. But as the emergency continues, while many flaws within the US's healthcare system have been revealed, increasingly there is a debate as to whether it is the for-profit system itself that is broken. Shia Britansi, Al Jazeera. Well, let's find out what's going on with the jobs market with uh, Show Alexander Sugihara, the co-founder and chief executive of gig economy finance app Portify. Show, good to have you with us. Uh, we've seen some horrendous job losses. What's it been like for gig economy workers? Yeah, it's, it's been tough all around. Uh, we're a mission-driven company. We pioneer inclusive credit for people with non-standard financial backgrounds. And so a portion of our users are gig economy workers. And we have some data on them uh, to see what the impact has been. And our data or analysis suggests that uh, income is down 72% since lockdown began in the UK for all gig economy workers. And uh, some of our customers that we speak to are having to repurpose uh, their earnings to pay for essential bills instead of uh, saving up for retirement, as an example. So it's a very difficult situation. And what's that meant for your business? The current market, uh, in, in traditional lenders are really tightening their lending standards at the moment. And we've seen from our own data that there's been about a 50% decline in the value of loans uh, being given to, to gig economy workers. And, and in this current climate, we're offering uh, flexible credit solutions using uh, cutting edge technology to assess someone's credit worthiness in, in real time, rather than relying on static credit uh, bureau scores. So we really do expect uh, demand for our inclusive products to, to skyrocket as a result. And uh, if, if uh, this crisis is anything like uh, what we saw in 2008, the overall market size of the gig economy may also grow. And so those things, uh, you know, from a purely business perspective, are, are positive development for a business like ours. How long is it, is it going to take, though, for, for anyone uh, at the moment who's, who's looking for work uh, when will hiring restart and, and will it ever be back to, to what it was before the pandemic? I, uh, I really wish I, I knew the answer to that one. I think um, there are too many unknowns in the current, uh, at the current time to predict an exact timing of when we might see a reversal. But I think there are a few uh, lessons that we might be able to learn from history. So if you look at the crisis of 2008, uh, one could estimate that uh, the self-employed and the gig economy are going to play a vital part in any recovery that we might see. For example, in the UK, uh, following the 2008 recession, we saw that 80% uh, of new jobs created came from self-employment and, and gig work. And so I think you can perhaps uh, say that uh, self-employment and gig work will be vital to a recovery, although the exact timing is, is difficult to predict at this moment in time. Now, it is uh, the, uh, the young, uh, the, the, the eldest, women and ethnic minorities that have been the hardest hit by, uh, by job losses. Uh, what are we to make of that? And how do we ensure that going forward, uh, we make an economy that, that's, that's more inclusive? Yeah, it's, it's a great question uh, and an important one. So in, in our own analysis, we, we've actually seen that um, women are more likely to hold jobs that in the UK are classified as essential work uh, compared to men. And so I think that uh, while I do agree with you know, the question's premise that 
uh, the impact of COVID is going to be uneven and, and could potentially cause further inequality. I do think we're still to fully see how this is going to play out, uh, considering that the impact of furloughs and, and job losses are only starting to be, to be felt. But uh, in any scenario, what, what definitely remains true is that we as a society uh, have an obligation to invest in and design inclusive services. And that's not just in finance. I think that's across healthcare and other industries. And it's, and it's pertinent that we do that uh, ASAP. We're doing our part by pioneering uh, inclusive credit products that are fair and really recognize the financial worthiness of people. And, and we hope that what we're doing can uh, inspire others to do similar things as well. Really good to talk to your show. Many thanks indeed for being with us on Counting the Cost. Thank you very much. Europe's biggest economy is back in recession a little over a decade since the last financial crisis. But trouble was brewing for Germany before the pandemic. And like everywhere else, worse is yet to come. The government has pledged one trillion euros to support the economy. But it's Chancellor Angela Merkel's radical 500 billion euro plan to help fellow European nations that could face opposition and push the union towards another crisis. Al Jazeera's Dominic Kane reports. A show of European solidarity by the two countries with its biggest economies. Vast financial grants, not loans, for the worst affected areas of the EU. Europe must stand together, which means we need to aim for a swift economic recovery. That's why we want to set up an open and shut fund to the sum of 500 billion euros. This should cover EU household expenses, not loans, but expenses of the hardest hit sectors and regions. We're convinced that this is not only justified, but also necessary to make money available on a European level, which we will then pay back in stages from the various European budgets. But this proposal does face a few potential pitfalls. First, it must gain support from other EU countries. And while clearly some southern member states may very well agree with it, others, notably the Austrians and the Dutch, well, they may take some convincing. And then there's yet another potentially formidable obstacle for Angela Merkel, her own country's Supreme Court. Which has just ruled that the German parliament and government have failed to scrutinise the way German money is used by the European Central Bank and set a deadline for ministers to provide evidence that what has been done so far is proportionate and constitutional. If not, the German Central Bank would have to withdraw from the European public spending payment programme. And while that possibility is a few months away, right now the coronavirus has plunged Germany into recession. The economy is projected to shrink by almost 10% in this quarter, and ministers have just learned of a near 100 billion euro shortfall in tax revenue. One area that has traditionally been seen as crucial to the German economy is the automotive industry. Around 800,000 jobs depend on it. And yet now that same sector is stalling. Many firms have placed staff on short working and some forecasters predict as many as 40% of jobs may be cut. And gerade here in Deutschland, think... Especially here in Germany, a lot of people think that we have reached the lowest point already, that the worst is over. But unfortunately, the general perception does not correspond with reality. The outlook for 2020, ladies and gentlemen, is gloomy. Which is why the major motor manufacturers have sought special help from the government, asking for a so-called cash for clunkers program, allowing old vehicles to be scrapped and replaced with newer versions. But so far, ministers have not agreed. We have an economic shock that goes across the entire spectrum of the economy, which, for example, hits domestic restaurants probably much, much worse than it hits the car industry. So the German government is rightly saying, OK, this is now the, not the time to, for sort of an export boosting uh, uh, package, but this needs to be a time for a broader package for the entire, entire German economy. Music to the ears of people in the service industries. On a warm afternoon in May, this Munich beer garden should be bustling with Bavarians. Instead, social distancing means far fewer customers in a pandemic that has put paid to profits. To be able to recoup our costs on this small place is not going to be possible. It means we're going to have to make some structural changes. That's why we're recalling our staff from their short-term contracts and are trying not to lose any jobs. When the pandemic began, the greatest worry was how to protect as many lives as possible from it. And so the mortality rate here has remained low, those worries have now expanded into how to protect Europe's biggest economy. 
Dominic Kane, Al Jazeera, Berlin. Joining us now via Skype from Newcastle is Klaus Visterson, Chief Eurozone Economist at Pantheon Macroeconomics. Good to have you with us, Klaus. Let's start then with this uh, deal between Macron and Merkel. 500 billion euros, a recovery fund, which is paid for by all members. Uh, uh, does this mean we're, we're edging finally towards fiscal union? Well, not exactly. I mean, I think it's very important to keep uh, the, um, the concepts apart here. I mean, a fiscal union is normally something we only discuss in a Eurozone context, but because this is now in an EU context, it's more a continuation or an extension of the existing framework. So the EU has a budget. It runs for seven years. Um, the vast majority of that budget is covered by uh, member states. And that is really what is being asked here, though there is one element, though, in which I agree sort of with, with, with the fiscal union perspective, namely that this does imply the commission to do a one-off debt issuance. Um, but um, the, the, um, the mechanism by which this is going to be paid back, as it were, is going to is not new. I mean, that is just that is the idea is to, to do this via the, the budget of all 27 member states, which is obviously the key difference here. That makes it probably more difficult to get through because everyone will have to agree on it. But is it going to get the support of all of the northern European nations? In its current con uh, format, no. I mean, we already have three countries, uh, well, at least two, Austria and Denmark, and they've said no. Now, these are small economies, so they can probably be squeezed, but it, it, does, it, it does show how difficult this will be. So um, the timeline at the moment is that we have this proposal from France and Germany now on, on May 27th, next week, and the Commission is going to unveil its official proposal or framework for how this recovery fund is going to look. And then, you know, the political game begins because, um, you know, I think this the, the Commission's suggestion will look very much like the Frank, French and German one. And then, you know, the, there's, there's going to be political negotiations here. But it will be very difficult because we already have some countries who've said no. How does this differ, though, from the, the ECB's uh, post-financial crisis bond-buying program that, that, that has recently been criticised by, by a German court? Yeah, yeah, this is a very important perspective. It's very different because when it's in the EU and not in the Eurozone, it kind of um, nullifies the, the critique uh, from the European, uh, from the German Constitutional Court because that was done in a Eurozone context with, in terms of what the ECB was doing. What's happening here is that it's being suggested that the Commission and then the EU does a, a one-off um, debt issuance to, uh, to fund this mechanism. And then whatever, whatever has to be paid back, and obviously there's going to be an interest rate on this loan, it's going to be a very low one, but it will have to be paid back, obviously. And then the idea is to extend the budget contributions from all 27 member states to the EU. This has nothing to do with the Eurozone, and I think that's a very important perspective because I think that's very deliberate from Germany and perhaps France as well to try to create this mechanism in an EU context instead of just a Eurozone context. Uh, let's talk about Germany specifically for, for a moment here. It's spent one trillion euros so far on supporting the economy. Um, some interesting data from the Bundesbank that real-time data is pointing to the possibility that the second quarter uh, decline in, in GDP won't be as bad as uh, as many initially thought. Yeah, I, I think that's, pretty, that's too early to say, but we can certainly say that this general theme seems to be important, namely that Germany seems to be doing a little bit better than the rest of the major economies. The first quarter numbers were better, so it would make sense to me that the second quarter number would be better as well. The, the, uh, the epidemic has not been as severe in Germany, which again means that the lockdowns have been lifted more quickly uh, this month in May than in other years on economies. So it kind of makes sense. I, I still think it's a little bit too early to say, but it certainly suggests that um, that the German economy is doing somewhat better in relative terms than in, in France and Southern Europe, where you know the, the, the output loss and, and GDP loss will be very severe in the second quarter. Really good to talk to you, Klaus. Many thanks indeed for being with us on Counting the Cost. Thank you. Thanks for having me. 
And that's our show for this week. If you'd like to uh, comment on anything that you've seen, get in touch with us. You can tweet me. I'm at A Finnegan. Please use the hashtag AJCTC when you do. Or you can drop us a line. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is our email address. As always, there's plenty more for you online at aljazeera.com slash CTC. That takes you straight to our page. And there you'll find individual reports, links, and entire episodes for you to catch up on. But that's it for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Adrian Finnegan from the whole team here in Doha. Thanks for being with us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.